as we look at the uh, Gospel of Matthew tonight, chapter number 11, uh, of course, we've been uh, focusing on the subject of discipleship and what it means, what its ramifications are, what, uh, what we can learn from as taught to, to the original disciples. Of course, we know those first 12 disciples. Uh, we know uh, about them. And then, of course, they went out and made disciples. And that was the command of God. Look at chapter number 11 and verse number 28 and 29. It says this, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, ye shall find rest in your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, a lot of times Christians will say, oh, it's hard to, to live a Christian life. The Lord Jesus said it's not. He said uh, it's easy. Now, of course, uh, I guess that's relative to where you're at. Uh, if you're not a committed person, if you don't want to uh, surrender your will to his will, then it yes, you fight against the pricks of your own desires and own lust. But yet, uh, in this case, he said, if you learn of me, you'll find out it's not near as hard as you think it is. And of course, a learner, a student, is a disciple. That's what he is. He gains information and knowledge about the Lord Jesus. In fact, uh, it's been said that uh, the Lord Jesus instituted the first Christian education program. He gathered those 12 together and he began to teach them and then he commanded them to go into all the world and make disciples. Teach all nations and make disciples. And so that's where we're at tonight. We're the results of the obedience of those original called out students of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now one thing about being in the educational system of the Lord Jesus Christ. Tuition is free. God paid it for us. Uh, would be good if you had kids in Christian school and you went up there at the beginning of the year and said, I'm going to start making these payments. Like, oh, no, somebody's come in and paid the whole year. Boy, that would, I, in my day, I would have rejoiced in many ways. But that rarely happens, if ever, but in this case, we can be in the school of Christ, and it doesn't cost us anything. It's free. The truth is, the classroom becomes the whole world. We can be taught anywhere. You can be overseas, and you can be in the school of Christ. You can be right here in northwest Florida or south Alabama and still be equally enrolled in the school of Christ. It's a lifelong course. Never ends. Uh, there's no graduation until he calls you home. In fact, we, we refer to the death of a saint. Uh, uh, we don't use the word, well, uh, he died or, uh, or they're deceased. We say they graduate. <laughs> we always use that. We preachers at funeral, we talk about the graduation and what they finished their school. Paul said, I finished my course. Uh, every student that goes to school looks forward to saying, I finished the course. I finished the year. I finished my degree. And so uh, we don't end this until uh, we no longer exist in this earth, but we're home to be with him. And one thing about it, you go to the school of Christ, Graduation is absolutely guaranteed. He will perform that good work in you, as we saw this morning, until the day of Christ. He, in the book of Hebrews, it talks about we'll be complete in him. And so there's no uh, uh, coming out early, and uh, you got to finish it out, and God will make sure that you finish his school. I always like the way Paul 
wrote it. Peter had some ways to be able to deliver that message. Uh, James had ways. All of them had unique uh, descriptions on how to deliver the message that they have gone on to be with the Lord or about to go on because they have finished the path and the course that God gave them. And uh, you can put it this way, post-graduation is out of this world. <laughs> you know, I think we're kind of wearing out this analogy. But uh, uh, the Lord Jesus spent the three and a half year ministry that he had here uh, teaching and schooling these disciples. But as you consider that, there are three that seem to have had special uh, tutoring. Peter, James, and John. You'll find that they popped up uh, over and over again as a kind of an inner group where he taught them above and beyond what uh, maybe the others even got. If you'll turn with me to Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter number one, and let's see where Peter, James, and John got started off as a trio in the school of Christ. Mark chapter number one, uh, they learn a special way of the purpose of God for their lives. Somebody said it's the school by the sea. Mark chapter number one and verse number 14. It tells us, now after that, John was put in prison, you know, John the Baptist. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, uh, the gospel they were believing is not the gospel we believe because Christ had not died. Christ had not gone to Calvary. And uh, sometimes you see one word in the Bible and you say, well, uh, yeah, he's talking about the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. Well, they didn't know about it. Listen, Peter later on when the Lord tried to tell him that he was going to Calvary, you know what he said? Not so, Lord. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Not on my watch. So uh, the gospel was the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. There's a different era of, of teaching there. But look at verse 16. Now, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me. That's the same as saying, Follow me. Come ye after me, and I will make you fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship mending nets. And straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. So you've got Andrew in the mix, but this is the beginning of the trio Peter, James, and John learning from the Lord Jesus his purpose in their life. It's one thing to meet him, and we all do that by faith, but it's another thing to know what he wants for you. And it's God's will that we do know what his will is. We spoke of that this morning. He wants to uh, fix our will and also that our will is willing to do to his good pleasure. And so the, the fact that he picked, the first people he picked to follow him were not bankers, were not professors, they were not scientists. Now you and I would think, maybe he'd go pay, uh, pick Nicodemus first. I mean, Nicodemus got a lot of money. He'd be a good man to get off the bat because he could help finance this ministry. That's not the way the Lord thought. The Lord picked fishermen for a specific purpose. He was going to relate that to the purpose 
he had in their lives that they might become fishers of men. They would understand when he said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Well, they were fishers by occupation. They knew all the details of a fisherman's life. They knew the, the way they went about their occupation, the nuances and the particulars that made them successful or unsuccessful. They knew all this. And so uh, two things in the Bible that God's people are referred to, we're referred by the Lord Jesus as fish and sheep. Those two particular animals are, uh, are really revealing to what our nature is. And so he went out there and he said, I'm going on the seashore and I'm going to pick these men. And in that group, you found uh, some of them casting their nets. Peter and Andrew were doing that. Everybody knows a cast net. And most of the time, uh, these cast nets were uh, nets that were uh, used on the shore. We still have them today. They're circular. Lay them on your shoulder, and you, you toss them over a, a school of fish or where you think a school of fish is at, and you pull the net in. And that was what Andrew and Peter were doing. They were literally casting from the seashore. Now, the others, uh, James and John, they were mending nets. So, therefore, what they were on, they were on the boat with their father, Zebedee, who apparently was a, the Joe Patty of the ancient. Uh, had a lot of boats, had a lot of people working for him. I, I, every time I go down to Joe Patty's, it's like a field trip. I, I, I never get over going in Joe Patty's. Uh, it's fascinating to me what all they have down and how they lay it out. And, uh, and to see, I was down there uh, this past week, and there's Frank Patty, and I don't, it's wonder. I thank God he's still alive. But he's sitting there with his microphone calling the numbers out. 24, 25, you know, and every now and then he gets aggravated to the customers because they won't. He said, 25, going once, going twice. If you don't bring your 25 sticker up here, we're missing, we're passing you. He'll get frustrated. But, uh, but that whole bunch is fishermen. You look at that group down there. They're fisher people. That's what they do. They, they're in the uh, processing of it, the catching of it, the preparing of the boats, the nets. Well, you had some here casting that. Now, it is kind of conducive also to represent the ministries that uh, these particular men had. Peter was one who went about his whole life after he got his uh, uh, his orders to, to be fishermen of men. He was about finding the fish and bringing them in. That's what he wanted. He, he had an evangelistic uh, approach to life. And James and John, they, they didn't cast the nets. They mended the nets. They were about fixing the holes that would cause fish to escape. So they, and if you read James and John's epistles, you'll find the emphasis more on my beloved, love one another. They're, they're, they're mending. They're mending with me. The Peter's always, you know, uh, believe, trust, uh, come to Jesus, preaching the gospel at Pentecost, uh, he's saying, repent ye, <laughs> come into the fold. So uh, while they, the Bible gives us specific uh, fields of their fishermen occupation, they're not without significance. Right off the bat, he laid it out. So uh, they one mended, one cast, and then look at the opportunity they have there in verse number I believe it was 17. He said, come ye after me. This is your opportunity to make a decision in your life. Uh, I have called you not just to put you up as a trophy and go around saying, look, uh, these burly, 
ungodly fishermen. They're now trophies of my grace. Look at them. That wasn't the purpose at all. He saved them that they might reach others for him. And that's why he tells them, go ye in all the world and preach the gospel. So he said, come ye after me, follow me. And the opportunity had a uh, significance in the fact he says, I'm going to take you, school you, teach you, put you through the courses, and you're going to come out as fishermen of men. I know we read that and we've considered it, but if you're a fisherman, a lifelong fisherman commercially, that had to be some of the most revealing information about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, it tells us oh, he came and the Lord himself said, the Son of Man cometh to seek and to save that which was lost. That's what his purpose was. Uh, he said, I come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. So uh, it, it's something when we focus on these three to see the grade levels and the courses that he put them through. The first thing he wanted them to do was to learn why they were called. And their lesson is our lesson. Now look, uh, there are reasons right today. we got health reasons and uh, sometimes age reasons that make our ability to fish for men not as uh, easy or available as it used to be. And I thank God that we have a emphasis on missionaries around the world because we're casting nets every time we take on another missionary because they're going out reeling in men. That's their purpose to go. Not a missionary we take on has an ultimate purpose of going and trying to build some kind of a, a school. Their goal may be, their goal is to reach men. The school is to educate disciples. So everybody we support has the goal of reach, even those in the Rock of Aged prison ministry. It's not to build a prison chapel. It's not to build a, a, a future Christians of America. It's to build a net to reach out and catch those that are lost and souls that need to be rescued. And so they, they learned and we still learn that the Lord Jesus gives us this opportunity. And I want you to see in verse 18, the reason they were successful is because they were obedient. We read, sing the song, trust and obey. But in verse 18, he says, and straightway, that's another way of saying immediately, straightway, no hesitation, they forsook their nets and followed him. So they dropped everything and went. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I gave the illustration where Emily Post was asked years ago in a newspaper article uh, what one should do if they received an invitation from the White House to dinner. And she said, any invitation from the White House to dinner is not an invitation, it's a command. <laughs> and when the Lord Jesus said, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men, it's not just an invitation, it's a command. And these men responded. Uh, they left what was occupying them. They left their way of life because they were obedient to his call. And, of course, when you got saved and I got saved, we, we left our lost and ungodly way of life. Now, if you got saved at an early age, thank God. Man, what a blessing. And I, I don't discount the new birth experience for a very young person. I don't, I, people say, well, they're too young. Well, listen, if they can hear the gospel and make a decision, what's right and wrong, and by faith believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, they shall be saved. Now, I don't know what age that is. I, I don't have a defining, what the, the old Baptist used to say, age of accountability. Well, that may be 
uh, one age for one person and a, a young child and maybe another. Uh, you know, uh, we've had little kids in years gone by that, uh, uh, you know, trusted Christ and, and uh, they were serious and, and they meant it and uh, they've gone on to live for the Lord and honored God with their lives. And then uh, we've had kids that uh, would raise their hand every time they came in children's church. So I want to be saved. Well, we thought you got saved last week. Well, I want to be saved again. <laughs> so, you know, there's a point where they, uh, they grasp it. Uh, the children of Israel were marching through the wilderness on the way to the promised land. And you recall the parents uh, were disobedient. The generation, the adult generation, many of them perished in the field. They perished because of their disobedience. But it said if the children could not discern between their left and right hand, they were given a pass. And so there is a point where God holds you accountable. And whenever that point is, uh, that is where we should fish. And that's why we have Hawaii and Sunday school and people have vacation Bible schools. And, and, and listen, that's why we have any kind of a ministry, an outreach of any way. Uh, that's why we have gospel tracts. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to August the 4th. We, of course, we're a polling place here. And uh, uh, we put out those chick tracks in the hallway as they line up to go vote. And last year, uh, they took over 200 of those chick tracks out of the rack while they were standing in line to vote. And so we'll ante up those track racks and make sure they're full. They have to stop there, and you look around, and, you know, those little tracks give them a little read material, but gospel's clear in every one of them. And so uh, we're fishing. That's what we're doing. And uh, we got some bites. And we hope we caught some. God knows we don't. But here uh, they, they, they learned about his purpose. And then in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 17, we find another thing that they learned in. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 17. They're in the school. They're learning the course about the purpose of the Lord Jesus. Now he's going to teach them something about his person. They, they're like anybody. Uh, he, they said they believed that he was... Uh, God manifest in the flesh, but their faith was weak. It's kind of like the fellow said, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. And we all have unbelief at times mixed with our belief. And if you say, well, I've never had any doubt whatsoever. Well, you're a robot. If you've sat out there, hey, every child of God I could ever think of or know, sit around sometime, and they say, you know, Lord, why? And Lord, if you really love me, why would you let that? And Lord, what purpose? I'm supposed to be one of your kids. Why'd you let this happen? There's a lot of uh, lack of faith. Well, here in Matthew chapter number 17, and we find where he teaches them about his person. And after six days, Jesus, notice who he took, Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. And he was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was as white as the light. So they got to see something of the person of the one they were following. They left everything they had. They left their life. They believed in him, or they wouldn't have left. But now he's saying, I'm going to give them a vision of just who they are following. And he said that the raiment was as white as light, and behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, talking with them. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. This is fantastic. We get to see your deity. We see that you are the Christ, the Messiah. Look at your supernatural. No one has the raiment and a light shining on them. This is God. And the Lord, and he says, Let's, if thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. 
And while he spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. So they're getting a triple dose. Uh, they're getting his face glowing as a light, as bright as the sun. Can you imagine looking dead up into the sun? And that's the face of the Lord Jesus on that mount. And then his raiment, literally white, glowing light. What a scene. And so Peter, let's do something. This is fantastic. We're going to build three tabernacles. And then God, basically, God the Father pretty much told Peter, shut up. He said, right in the middle of it, a voice came out of the cloud. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And so in this lesson, in this course, he didn't teach them about his purpose. They'd already learned that for their life. He's now teaching about his person in revealing that he truly is God manifested in the flesh. They had a visual on that. They didn't hear uh, fables. They didn't get this passed down second and third voice, they experienced for themselves something that changed their life forever and would go to their grave with as the motivation of everything they fought and did with the Lord Jesus Christ came from this episode right here. He said, this is my beloved son. And so he's training them to learn. Now, one thing that that mountain top experience prove to them that the Old Testament record was absolutely true. They saw Moses, the prophet Elijah, and Moses, the giver of the law. So all that they had known or heard in their Jewish upbringing concerning uh, the Old Testament, it was absolutely verified physically for them. And then these two were real. These are not, you know, you say, Peter made a statement later on. And, and let me read what, what Peter said in, in his epistle. He said, for we have not followed cunningly devised faith. When we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, why would he say that? Because you see, humanity has always had fables about serving their gods. We hear them today, Apollos, Zeus, Thor, hey, Artemis. And it's all kind of fairy tale stuff that people put together about an imagined little god that doesn't even exist, but tradition and fables have passed down this false teaching and deified these individuals that they've made up with their own cunning devices. And Peter said, that's not what we're doing here. What we're doing is we're giving you the truth that we have been eyewitnesses of his majesty. And that's why uh, to this day, you know, the, the world has still its cunningly devised fables. You know, they talk, how many times you, every week you hear they found something and they said it's five million years old. And this was the beginning, this little tiny cell we found in this fossil, this tiny, tiny spot was the beginning of humanity. Two million years ago. I'm thinking, why do they keep being? It's a fable. They're, they're using the, the uh, Darwin's fables about him. And they continue to build on these fables. And now they got it where, uh, you know, they've convinced uh, most of America that this is the way, the truth, and the life. And you, and you look at it's like a fairy tale. 
And they, they don't mind just throwing out millions of years. And, you know, everybody goes, oh, that's pretty impressive. Think of it. All the record we have of, of writing or even art cannot be verified past a few thousand years. We have plenty of uh, inscriptions and tablets that date back to early Egyptian history four or five thousand years ago. We've got Babylonian inscriptions that date back 3,000, 3,500 years ago. We have some inscriptions in the Orient that date back maybe four or five thousand. We don't have anything that humans have done in the area of knowledge and information that can be verifiably dated 500,000 years ago. They can be speculation. They can be guess. But we know what we can verify. Absolute. And I saw this past week. The uh, archaeologists have found that maybe the Bible, they once again come out and say, maybe the Bible's true. And the reason they said that, they were doing some excavation work around the town of Laish, Laish, the Old Testament town that King David built. And it was Laish that Sennacherib, the Assyrian king, had laid siege to. In fact, in some of King uh, Sennacherib's uh, uh, inscriptions and, and uh, prisms and, and uh, clay tablets, he talks about laying siege to this town. But what they found now, you know, uh, King Hezekiah was faced with this man destroying uh, his uh, capital. And the angel of the Lord came, remember one night, and slew 185,000 Assyrians. Now, they found that there's been an encampment around there, and they're beginning to find evidence that there was a military catastrophe. And so they came out this week once again. God bless their little souls. There's a possibility that the Bible description was true. I'm thinking, you little mindsets. God is able to declare the truth, give us the truth, and preserve the truth. I mean, he's God. What else could... Why would you doubt that God could not keep his own word? And so here they, they learned this. And then another thing they learned from this experience was life after death. They knew Moses and Elijah had died. All of a sudden they're right here before them. And so when God took them up in this course, he didn't explain his purpose for their life. He explained to them the person who he was. I think they got it. That's why Peter said there, we declare unto you his majesty. And he said, for he received from God the Father honor and glory. And there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him. In the Holy Mount. Now that was written some 45 years after their experience. So what I'm saying is the lesson they learned up on that mount that day in school was a lifelong lesson. They never forgot it. Look, they could have took the test 45 years later and made a hundred on it. They didn't forget anything they saw and heard. And they preached and lived and taught it and died by it. And so uh, as a child of God, we're learning and we're taught to follow him and be a learner. Take his yoke upon us. And Jesus said, and learn of me. Now, there are other uh, aspects. Uh, I, uh, we're going to follow one day the next time we get into this. The next, he had three seminars that he taught them. If you went to these three seminars, it was going to change your life, your goals, and your abilities. We like to go to seminars because it enhances our understanding of a particular subject. 
You know, you go to a seminar, you're supposed to pick up information to make you be better. Well, they had some seminars, and uh, they're gonna. He's gonna give them to them. When it's all said and done, when he finishes with them, they're prepared for life. That's the goal of being educated: is to prepare you for your life. Sad to say, in our universities today, they're not too prepared. One of my favorite things: watch Jesse Waters and his crowd go out on the street and interview college students and graduates. And there's some things you think by 22 years old, you think that someone would know about the basic information about the country. I mean, you see how many are, in, and, and I know this is a microchasm of, of students. Look at, I've heard people say when they say, who was the, First president of the United States, people say Ronald Reagan. And you've seen people, uh, and, and they said, they asked one day, uh, who was uh, Aaron Rodgers, uh, the former Packer football quarterback, and now the New York Jets? And people say, where did, what office is Aaron Rodgers hold? And they would say, vice president? I mean, if you don't know about history, you ought to know about something about sports. And if you don't know any of that, but what you know is millions and millions and millions of years ago in a faraway land, in a time of enchantment, there was. Oh, they know that. But, uh, hey, I hope maybe by following these uh, lessons, and this discipleship program, it'll help you and I as we follow him and he makes us fishers of men. Let's bow our heads tonight, if you would. Lord Jesus, as we put on the yoke of surrender in order that we might learn of you, we know that without obedience, we become students that fail. So we're asking you to help us not only to learn, but help us to obey so that we might be true disciples of the Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray.